Good afternoon and welcome to the AUC Data Science Seminar Series, DS Cubed. While guests are arriving in our virtual space, please take the time to get comfortable, relax, and prepare for a very exciting discussion today. And please remember, for all things AUC Data Science, simply visit our website, datascience.aucenter.edu. Here, you will find an array of information and resources, including our current and previous events. And a very important note, all seminars can be found on our YouTube page to view, share, and even view again, as much as you desire. So please subscribe and engage. Welcome to the inaugural W.B. Du Bois Data Science Symposium. We are really excited about today's events, and we are really excited that you all will be joining us today. So I, again, just thank you everybody for joining us. We're gonna have a really great experience um, going through different data science topics. And before we begin, I just wanna remind everybody, we have a community agreement that we'll all be good people, and I know we will. So the Data Science Initiative is committed to creating and maintaining a community dedicated to the advancement application and transmission of knowledge and creative endeavors through academic excellence where all individuals who participate in programs and activities can work and learn together in an atmosphere free of harassment, exploitation, or intimidation. So to foster a positive professional environment, we encourage everybody to abide by the following. Please use welcoming and inclusive language Please be respectful of different viewpoints and experiences, and please show courtesy and respect towards other members. We also want to everybody to know that we are recording. So, and right now, this session is being broadcast live over Facebook. We will be broadcasting the seminars over Facebook live. But I just want to let you know that your, your presence here provides con your consent to be either photographed, filmed, and or otherwise recorded. Your entry constitutes your consent to photography, filming, or recording in any universe, this and other ones that may exist, and use of your appearance, voice, and name for any purposes connected with the production, social media post, or any other media created from the event in perpetuity. So if you do not agree to the foregoing, you may want to log out at this time. So just, just a heads up, we are recording. And we, we hope to provide some of these presentations and film later on social media. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and I am going to first uh, introduce President George French. In 2019, President French, he became the fifth president of Clark Atlanta University. And Clark Atlanta University is the largest United Negro College Fund member institution in the country and also the largest private HBCU within the state of Georgia. He's a three-term board member for the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges. He's the chair of the Atlanta University Center Council of Presidents, and also the chair of the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Association Council of Presidents and a member of the Metro Atlanta Chamber Board of Directors. He comes to us with great leadership and has exponentially exceeded all fundraising records at Clark Atlanta and has maintained a stable enrollment and with his visionary leadership and style, we are marching Clark Atlanta University forward. And with that, please, President French. Thank you so much um, for that kind, warm introduction, uh, Dr. Washington. Uh, certainly to you as our um, director uh, for the AUC of this data science initiative, Dr. Washington, we thank you for your leadership most certainly to all of the AUC faculty and staff who are gathered here today for this inaugural W.E.B. Du Bois Data Science Symposium. What an exciting day in the life and history of the Atlanta University Center. This symposium is in, and the cutting edge research that many of you are, are doing on this call in data science 
to address issues that face the world and Black America in um, um, uh, uh, specifically are vitally important now more than ever. What? Why do I say that? I say that because as we know that in March of 2020, the World Health Organization um, deemed the COVID-19 to be pandemic. Pandemic of the nature that we have not seen in over 100 years. This pandemic, of course, was precipitated by the SARS-CoV-2 virus and associated diseases um, with COVID-19. The, the point that we make is we find ourselves in world pandemic and we're depending upon science now more than ever. Not science for convenience, not necessarily science to make our lives easier, but this is about science for the very existence of our citizenry. So we need data scientists now more than ever. So it's befitting to have this AUC data science initiative to host this inaugural conference. And it is apropos to name it after Dr. Du Bois. You all remember that Dr. Du Bois was a visionary in data visualization. In the late 19th century, he sought a way, in the late 19th century, Dr. Du Bois sought a way to show the mixed plight, the political obstacles, and the institutional racism that African Americans were facing at that time. You might recall that his, his studies um, uh, were specific to African Americans in both Atlanta and Philadelphia primarily. However, after finding and after uh, making conclusions and, and testing hypotheses, he, he, he made these conclusions and he shared them not only with the citizenry and academicians of the Atlanta University Center and the Philadelphia African-American community, but he also shared his findings with the United States Department of Labor, thereby uh, making him one of the lead authorities in sociology and, and research upon which the United States Department of Labor depended for decades. Dr. Du Bois wrote, it's not one problem, but rather a plexus of social problems, some new, some old, some simple, some complex. And these problems, Du Bois said, have their one bond of unity in the act that they group themselves above those Africans whom two centuries of slave trading brought into the land. Yes, Dr. Du Bois was a man ahead of his time. His life, his life in the veil theory was derived from visualizing sociology's scope of, in history, statistics, and demographics. Du Bois, he delved into the structural forces of oppression that separated black and white populations in the areas of educational attainment, voting rights, and land ownership. And here we are today, 124 years since Dr. Du Bois first came to Atlanta University in 1897 as a faculty member. We are still reckoning today with the same issues that Dr. Du Bois addressed then. Dr. Du Bois laid the foundation for solving these pressing problems. He, he laid the foundation for why and how we are here today. So Dr. Washington and colleagues, I applaud each of you for taking up the torch and using your research in data science to continue addressing the issues facing African Americans in 2021. We know the problem statements. We look to you now for solutions. Have a wonderful symposium and a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much, President French, for those kind words. Very insightful and as, yes we happily carry that torch and lead it forward. Thank you. So, thanks again. So our next speaker is um, Dr. Michael Hodge. 
He's the interim executive director of the Atlanta University Center Consortium. He's the immediate past provost and senior vice president of academic affairs at Morehouse College and has a number of hats and served at a variety of institutions. In um, 2013 to 14, he was Georgia Sociologist of the Year. And as a sociologist, Dr. Hodge enjoys analyzing data uh, from either in-depth interviews of college-aged African-Americans concerning risky sexual activity in the age of HIV and AIDS. And in some years ago, maybe just a few years ago when he was a budding graduate student, he actually used some of Du Bois's data work in his studies. With that, Dr. Hodge, would you pr please provide us some remarks? Thank you, Dr. Washington. And greetings to everyone, Dr. French. Uh, thank you for your remarks and insight uh, for thank our you. symposium today. So I, I bring you greetings from the Atlanta University Center Consortium. We are the largest and oldest association of historically black colleges and universities in the world. Established 92 years ago in 1929, the consortium is comprised of four member institutions, like Atlanta University, Morehouse College, Morehouse School of Medicine, and Spelman College, and supported by the AUC Robert W. Woodruff Library. The consortium is a vibrant intellectual community with a long tradition of scholarship, service, and community engagement. We are a collaborative learning community of nearly 10,000 students. Collectively, the AU Center Consortium Schools represents the largest producer of African Americans who go on to receive their doctorates in STEM fields. Our collaborations allow students to excel from the dual degree engineering programs we host to the art, history, and curatorial studies collective, from our Public Health Sciences Institute to our world-class medical school with its number one ranked online master's program and a brand new shared student health facility. And of course, the program of which you are now partaking, the Atlanta University Center Consortium Data Science Initiative, W.E.B. Du Bois, Data Science Symposium. You are now part of the AUCC legacy of engagement and education. So welcome and please enjoy today's inaugural W.E.B. Du Bois Data Science Symposium. Thank you, Dr. Washington. Thank you so much, Dr. Hodge. I'm glad you can join us today. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and we have a few uh, messages, one from Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. So Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, she is the 60th mayor of the city of Atlanta. Georgia Trend Magazine named Mayor Bottoms as a 2020 Georgian of the year. And she has a ton of notable accomplishments to date, including the establishment of the city's first fully staffed Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and the appointments of an LGBTQ affairs coordinator and human trafficking fellow and the citywide elimination of cash bail bond, the closure of the Atlanta City Detention Center to ICE detainees and the rollout of the most far reaching financial transparency platform in the city's history, Atlanta's open checkbook. She is a proud member of the Atlanta community and is a member of the State Bar of Georgia, Jack and, of Georgia, Jack and Jill of America, the Lynx Incorporated and Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She has also served on the board of Families First and shares her own personal story of adoption and advocates on behalf of adoption and foster care. She's a proud product of the Atlanta Public Schools and she graduated from Frederick Douglass High School, received her undergraduate degree from FAMU, Florida A&M University, which is a historically black college and university in Tallahassee, Florida. She earned her Juris Doctorate from Georgia State <coughs> University College of Law. And I think I can speak for everyone here and, and across the country that we are really thankful for the mayor's service, for her work here in Atlanta, and also for her national impacts. So I'm just going to play a message from her. Hello, I'm Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, and I am happy to welcome you to the inaugural W.E.B. Du Bois Data Science Symposium. Thank you to the Atlanta University Center Consortium 
for your efforts towards developing cutting edge data science through research and scholarship. W.E.B. Du Bois once said, the most important thing is to remember this, to be ready at any moment to give up what you are for what you might become. This past year, we've all witnessed the importance of science, and I believe its power provides the possibility of what you can discover and what you might create. Through his data science work, the boy told a story of resilience and perseverance, which speaks to the spirit of Atlanta, the AUC, and the HBCU community. As mayor, I'm committed to fostering the advancement of STEM in our communities and providing access to opportunities for our young people. I do hope that today's symposium will allow each of you time to reflect, share, and gather information that will help address some of the issues that we face each and every day in our communities. On behalf of the city of Atlanta, thank you for using your knowledge and research to shape our city and our nation. You make us so very proud. So we are really thankful for the mayor to provide her remarks today. Second, we have remarks from Congressman Jerry McNerney, who was sworn into office on January 4th, 2007. He represents California's ninth district, which includes the large portion of San Joaquin County in the Central Valley, as well as parts of Contra Costa and Sacramento counties. Congressman McNerney has a PhD in mathematics, as do I, he served several years as an engineer at Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico. He later worked as a senior engineer and harnessed wind energy, including manufacturing wind turbines. He's, Congressman McNerney is honored to serve on the Committee on Energy and Commerce, which is the oldest standing legislative committee in the U.S. House of Representatives. The Congressman is also a member of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. This committee has jurisdiction over non-defense federal scientific research and development, including the federal agencies such as NASA, the National Science Foundation, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and the Office of Space and Technology Policy. He was actually encouraged to run for office by his son, Michael, and so that he could go out and make a difference and bring some STEM-based solutions to the congressional floor. And so we are thankful for his service as a Congressman and we are thankful that he's with us today. Hello, this is Congressman Jerry McNerney and I wanna thank our hosts for giving me the opportunity to welcome you all to the inaugural W.E.B. Du Bois Data Science Symposium. As Congress's only PhD mathematician, I can see firsthand how the foundations created by Dr. Du Bois in the field of data science visualization have helped improve policymaking. From environmental justice and the disparate impact of climate change on vulnerable communities, to the harms of income inequality that stem from a system deliberately designed to disadvantage specific groups, these injustices leave a lasting and measurable impact. To all of you who are here today, thank you for your continuing commitment to this work. For mathematicians, facts and figures always tell a story, but it's the work that you are engaged in that's bringing this important narrative to life for everyone to see. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. I look forward to hearing from many of you in the future about the important work you're undertaking. Thank you. And if y'all could catch, he had a wind turbine in this back window, which is so super cool. So now I'm just going to do a speed dry run. What's going on with the data science initiative here at the Atlanta University Center? So I'm going to give a quick overview of what we're up to. And then at 12 o'clock sharp, I'll introduce our keynote speaker. We have a chat going in the HOVA app platform. So as I'm talking or as anybody's talking, if you want to put comments or suggestions or questions in that chat, please feel free to do so. So the Atlanta University Center Data Science Initiative, we serve four institutions plus a library. 
So we work with Clark Atlanta University, Spelman College, Morehouse College, Morehouse School of Medicine, and the AUC Robert Woodruff Library. So we aim to leverage the Atlanta University Center's rich history and social justice to support data science research and teaching across all of these institutions. And we also address social justice for black lives. We have two goals for the initiative. We aim to develop talent, and we also aim to create new knowledge, to create new knowledge in terms of advocating for data science to address race, gender, and social justice aspects of data science. We do that through our curriculum, research, and our engagement. We are busy. What does our work involve? Well, our work involves a lot, and it is actually a lot of fun work. This fall, we will be launching, cross your fingers, a minor at Clark Atlanta, Morehouse, and Spelman. Um, and this is based off of an AUC data science minor framework. We also have a cornerstone course for the minor entitled Data in the African Diaspora. This summer, we're gonna launch a, a post back program, Open Source by Open Doors. So we're really excited about this. This is for recent graduates. If you know somebody who graduated recently and would like to have that extra boost up, please send them our way. We also have a pre-freshman summer experience. Um, it's a one-week program in July for incoming AUC students. We have a data science club. We will be starting up a virtual computer lab funded by Coca-Cola and SAP in the next week or two, we'll say. We have a mini grants program where we are funding AUC faculty and staff, both in research and curriculum development this summer. We're super excited to see about the work they create. We also have an AUC faculty affiliate program. We host learning and research communities. These are led by faculty and they explore different topics in data science. So we're really excited to provide these programs here in the AUC community. Just a little bit about the data science minor. This will be coming to an institution near you in the AUC based on the learning outcomes, mathematics, statistics, programming, modeling, data curation, ethics, and communication to position our students for success, either in data science or the workplace that demands more skills in data science. Like I said, the virtual computer lab that will be coming very soon to the library, and this will support both data science research and curriculum across the AUC. Our mini grants awards that were funded, we are really looking forward to seeing the projects that will be laid out this summer. And these projects span everywhere from chemistry to sociology, to criminology, to whatever you can imagine. Data science really spans all disciplines. This past um, semester, we had a student data challenge and we are really proud of our students for rising to the challenge to bring solution to erase child trafficking. So big shout out to our groups the Clarkites and the newbie dates for really rising to this challenge. We have the Open Doors by Open Source Post Baccalaureate Program that will be launching this summer. It's funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So if you know anybody, any students who could benefit from this program, send them our way. We have a pre-freshman summer experience that will be in July. So if you know of an incoming student or like more information, please send them our way. It's a great way to have students be introduced to data science before they come to campus and also to make some new friends. Over the semester, we have held a number of data science seminars on the second and fourth Fridays. Today, we are at the fourth Friday of the month, if you didn't know, and we will be pausing the seminar series, but we will be back up and running in the fall semester. So look out for us in the fall. And if you miss any of these awesome talks, these are just a few, but we have more. You can find them either on our Facebook page or our YouTube page. Um, so today we're going to have the joy of listening to 26 lightning talks. We have seven roundtable discussions. I apologize that they're concurrent and they're all good and all amazing. So we'll see what we can do. And feel free between the lightning talks and roundtable discussions, you're welcome to hop around uh, via the HOVA app. And we have two wonderful keynotes that will be coming your way today. Um, so in the AUC, we are hiring a number of positions in data science. So if you'd like more information, please reach out to us. The AUC Data Science Initiative, we, are, we work really closely with our faculty advisory board, which is made up of representatives across all four institutions and the library. 
And we also, you know, I report to the Council of Chief Academic Officers, which is made up of all four institutions and the library. So with this leadership, we are really positioned to serve not only the AUC community, but also serve the nation. So what's coming next for the Data Science Initiative? Next underway, we are going to be developing a partners program, which will establish meaningful relations with industries, government, uh, agencies, educational institutions. We envision that the partners program will allow entities to come work with our faculty and staff to develop research and also let's link our bold visions and ambitious plans to financial support. What are we working on next? A lot and, <clears throat> ooh, excuse me. So we are really excited about all of our upcoming programs. And, <clears throat> excuse me, this summer we will have workshops for AUC faculty and graduate students. So if you didn't know, please sign up. Our organizing team for the symposium is a dream team of six people. So myself as the director, we also have Jerry Volsey, who's the deputy director, Bettina Gardner, who's the administrative director, Tommy Taylor is a communication specialist, Judy Davis Carroll is the Chief Operating Officer at RH Bolton and Michael Jenkins, who's tech support with RH Bolton. We are, I am really thankful for this organizing team for really pulling this symposium together and creating a great experience for us all. So with that, I am going to introduce our keynote speaker. So our keynote, and plus maybe I can get a drink of water too. So our keynote speaker for the top of the hour is Dr. Sean Jones. He's the assistant director for the Directorate of Mathematical and Physical Sciences at the National Science Foundation. With over 12 years at the NSF, Dr. Jones has served as a program director for centers, national facilities, sustainability efforts, and broadening participation initiatives. He also served as an assistant director for physical sciences and engineering for the White House Office of Science and Technology during the Obama administration. <coughs> Prior to joining NSF, he was at the University of Florida. And since my voice is going to be failing, I'm just gonna cut through the chase. He'll probably talk more about himself. I don't know what's going on. I get all choked up when I get around Dr. Jones. That's, that's probably what this is. He was also chair professor of engineering at Nor Norfolk State University, senior scientist at LexCorp, worked here in Atlanta at Lucent, and authored a whole bunch of papers and ten, has 10 US patents. With that, Dr. Jones, we're thankful for you to come today and talk to us, us about what's happening at NSF, the national landscape around all things, either AI, data science, and quantum. Dr. Jones? Great, thank you so much, Dr. Washington, and thank you for that kind introduction. And it is a pleasure to be virtually back in Atlanta. I consider my, my first home, actually. Um, I worked there at Lucid Technologies and collaborated um, quite a bit, actually, with the AUC and worked well with um, Dr. Michael Washington there at Clark Atlanta, trying to do some things at Bell Laboratories, but also at one of two only Black um, telecommunication startup companies, LuxCore, um, that you mentioned, and worked very nice with AUC and looking forward to doing more types of collaboration. Let me share my screen. Excellent. Again, it, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, with you today and to start this inaugural WB Du Bois Data Science Symposium. We will talk a lot about uh, technology revolution within AI, data, and quantum. And I'd like to spend a lot, a lot of time actually on quantum. I'll give you some overview about the National Science Foundation. You might not be as well aware of what we do um, at the foundation and kind of how the parts uh, link with each other. Love to talk a little bit about science priorities. They're becoming much more important in terms of driving the conversation in the nation. And again, I'll end on quantum because this is an area where I don't see our institutions and I don't see people like us participating as much as, as we need and as I'd like, we'd like to spend some time talking about those opportunities. So I am at the National Science Foundation. NSF is one of federal agencies that work in fundamental and basic science. We're actually the lead agency, if you will, on fundamental science. The other agencies that you know, Department of Energy, NIH, uh, NIST, they actually do some fundamental science, but they're mission-oriented agencies, whereas our mission really is to promote the progress of science. That's it. That's what we do. We are the house and the home of fundamental research. 
and that's important when you look at where fundamental research um, is done and who funds it in terms of universities. And actually, NSF is the home of fundamental basic research when you look at the university enterprise as a whole, and we're the sole funder, if you will, for some disciplines. As this bar chart shows for computer science, for example, it's um, highly important uh, for the National Science Foundation to be engaged in basic science because we are the agency that funds that. When you look at uh, disciplines within my own purview of mathematical and physical sciences in math, engineering, and the physical sciences, those numbers are compelling as well. And when you think about sub-disciplines within these fields, like condensed matter physics, for example, that reliance on basic funding from the National Science Foundation goes from 44% more into the 80%. And so in terms of the federal ecosystem and the federal enterprise, NSF is the place where we like to say discoveries begin. This is where basic science starts and it happens. At the National Science Foundation, there are nine science directorate and offices, and the agency itself is very flat. We're kind of modeled like a university where you can think of our director of the agency as like the president and executive provost. And these nine directorates and offices function like colleges, if you will. So the College of Biological Sciences, the College of Engineering, the College of Mathematical and Physical Sciences, et cetera. And within each one of these directorates and offices will be a complement of what we call divisions that are like disciplinary departments. We're very flat because we are trying to dispromote silos. And so while we do fund core research that underpins our disciplines, we like this flat organization so that we can have cross-disciplinary research, cross-disciplinary activities going throughout all of science. And so this is our, our function. And again, I'm, um, I reside and I lead the Mathematical and Physical Sciences Organization. This is a chart that we publish every year, it's NSF by the numbers. Um, the link there shows uh, this particular data and this particular report talking about the outputs from the National Science Foundation. And at that link, you can find uh, previous reports as well. And I'll just highlight just a few things um, on this NSF by the numbers. First is our agency is about 8.5 billion in funding. And with the 8.5 billion, we fund around 11,000 proposals a year out of the 41 that are submitted. So our success rate ranges between 25 and 30%, depending on the discipline. And our agency is really all about people. Um, out of all the federal agencies, because our mission is to promote the progress of science, we fund a lot of people every year. We fund a lot of early career people and we, we fund many people across the pathway, senior investigators all the way down to undergraduate students, and in some cases, even high school students. This is also what sets us apart from some of the other federal, federal agencies. And you can consider NSF maybe a feeding ground for some of the work that goes on at Department of Energy and NIH, where the first funding may actually come from the National Science Foundation. This is more of a traditional org chart, of course, with the boxes here, but it, it does uh, show who are the leads of the other uh, directorates and offices within the National Science Foundation. But more importantly, I wanna introduce to you our new director, Dr. Seth Raman Pontanathan, who started at the National Science Foundation last year. And he brings a brand new and bold vision and a lot of energy and excitement um, to the agency. With a new director comes a new vision and a new set of NSF priorities. And I just wanna highlight these because this is really driving the research agenda for the agency. And as he has a collaborative spirit, to a degree driving some of the work that we're doing in partnerships with other agencies. His, his priorities um, center around three pillars, advancing basic research, increasing accessibility and inclusivity, as well as global leadership, recognizing that science happens um, throughout the throughout the globe and we cannot be siloed off from the great work that's going on across the world but we want to be leaders in that a cross cutting pillar of his and actually his signature uh, priority is increasing translation increasing innovation and doing all of this through increased partnerships or tip this is again a signature cornerstone of his um, of his vision and it permeates all three of these in terms of the way that we will advance basic science, we will increase accessibility and inclusivity, and we will be global leaders in having this basic research science agenda. At the same time that we brought on um, our new director, 
Our National Science Board, which is our governing body, started on a visioning plan of 2030. And they also have four pillars. And they, they actually, even though the words are a little different, they align quite nicely with the director's vision. And looking at the Biden-Harris administration and their four pillars, even though the words are different here as well, many of the subcomponents of their very high level grand challenges for the country align quite nicely with the NSF priorities as well as the NSB 2030 vision. I wanna highlight one particular area, accessibility and inclusivity. And we've been discussing this at the National Science Foundation as addressing the missing or the invisible millions. And again, this ties quite nicely with the pillars of the National Science Board as well as the administration who have been putting out substantial number of executive orders trying to address all four of their pillars, but significantly in racial equity and in climate change. This one pillar is very important because the new director has really challenged us, along with the Biden-Harris administration, to develop new programs immediately that will address and impact these. And I want to highlight these now, and we'll highlight them again at the end, and you will get copies of this presentation, so you will actually have access to these links. Over the last few months, we have created now new programs that address the basic science areas within the National Science Foundation. So this is in partnership and goes beyond what is done in the Human Resources Division or HRD, where HPCU up, TCUP and HSI up uh, sit. These are programs that reside in the research directorates providing specific targeted opportunities for MSIs and for underrepresented minorities. For example, we all know about the EIR program, that's historical, but we're gonna add additional resources to have more opportunity under EIR. Within my own directorate, we've now started a postdoctoral program for underrepresented minorities to see more of us in the, in the academy. We've also launched a research initiation grant to help brand new faculty and young career faculty start their careers um, within the mathematical and physical sciences. Engineering has now started a research initiation grant program called ERI, exactly for the same purposes. And the Computer Science Directorate has now started a much larger campaign to incorporate MSIs again into their research programs called the uh, SIZE MSI program. These are all brand new programs, again, that reside in the research directorates to really couple and have better access through minority serving institutions and underrepresented minority faculty engaged in research at the National Science Foundation. That's very important because it provides a new platform for our um, institutions to really engage in the science priorities of the agencies. So within the National Science Foundation two and a half years ago, we embarked on a new journey for us to actually have science challenges, goals, priorities, what we call the big ideas. And there was actually six research big ideas and we were trying to promote these through our research platforms, but again, without these targeted programs. One such big idea was harnessing the data revolution, which is very timely because the AUC data initiative and data consortium um, fits right nicely into this big idea. And the goal of HDR here is to enable these new modes of data-driven discovery. And HDR will not only work on the foundations of data science itself, but also be a cross-cut across the whole foundation where we can advance data science and data initiatives, um, again, through all of the science areas. My own science expertise um, lies in materials research. And so this is a grand challenge for us, how to harness data and couple that with AI so that we could advance our field as well. When we look at the harnessing data um, big idea, it actually has evolved over the last two and a half years, starting now with our Tripods program, which brought data scientists, mathematicians, computer scientists, next to a, a, a domain scientist to advance a particular area. We then advanced that with um, programs that were all about education and workforce development, and we've now grown our HDR activities now to include larger activities called institutes, where we're using larger groups, larger teams to build out these scientific frameworks and provide coordination across these institutes, hopefully looking towards more convergence research, looking at grand challenges where multiple disciplines need to work together, use data to find uh, grand challenges. So as a summary on the HDR activity, the left-hand side, we see data science challenges. 
Of course, for the HDR, we want to advance the science of data science, but we also want to leverage this opportunity to, again, advance not just scientific problems, but also societal problems and use data for societal good and for societal change. And here are just, again, a few of the examples as um, of, of different types of science that we'd like to impact. On top of the big ideas are now the administration-wide priorities. Over the last few years, we haven't actually had a lot of science innovation priorities come from the White House, but last year, the White House, through the Office of Science and Technology Policy, in conjunction with OMB, actually set out a bold vision through their science and technology priority memo that all agencies um, responded to. This, this um, document actually lays out multiple industries of the future, and five of the industries of the future called out within this science and technology priority memo are right in the wheelhouse of the National Science Foundation. And they're actually listed here below, the quantum information sciences, AI, advanced wireless, biotechnology, and advanced manufacturing. These science priorities not only impact um, the National Science Foundation, but again, interact and impact the whole federal enterprise. And so it's important to watch and to take note of the science and technology priority memos because resources, from the president's budget to congressional appropriation will be funneled into these priorities. And it is so for the National Science Foundation. The interesting thing about each one of these uh, science priorities is that there is a strong data component to each one of these. And we're in a, we are envisioning and, and imagining that we can expand our data enterprise under each one of these as a rubric to advance the science itself. But the one area I wanna spend a little more time with you on is quantum information science. So QIS is an area where we're seeing a lot of uptick in proposals and interest from the community, but not as much interest from our community, from minority serving institutions and from underrepresented minorities that are applying as PIs, regardless of institution type. So we'd like to talk a little bit about QIS and what are some of the advantages of working in this area. So what exactly is quantum information science and engineering? Well, we know that as physical objects reduce in scale and start to approach the, the atomic scale, um, they actually leave the classical um, limit and actually move into more exotic quantum effects that are governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. Einstein himself, looking at the equations, called this spooky science itself because the laws of quantum mechanics are quite different from classical mechanics. And there's two um, things that derive out of uh, quantum mechanics. The first one being superposition, where quantum systems can exist in, poss in all possible states. So, so not just um, degenerative states, but all possible states until the state itself is observed. The other outcome of quantum mechanics is entanglement, where again, these states themselves are correlated regardless of, of distance. And so if you impact one state, regardless of the proximity, whether it's close or extremely far away, it's correlated and impacting one state actually impacts the other state. So again, something very unique under quant the laws of quantum mechanics as opposed to classical. A well-known example of this is in quantum computing where we're very used to thinking about bit or a, the, the memory of computing as a zero or one that are very discrete binary um, entities. But when we start talking about quantum computing, we introduce this concept of a qubit because of superposition where a zero, a one, or any of the combinations in between are actually all probable. So qubits are very interesting because the quantum power storage possibility actually scales as a factor of two to n. So 10 qubits looks like a thousand plus, I mean, I'm sorry, 10 bits look like a thousand plus qubits, which means substantially faster computers, more powerful computers. And when you um, think about entanglement with computing systems, provide for very robust communication systems that can actually um, outperform traditional systems in not just speed, power, but also in security. And so that makes the White House and um, our DOD agencies very um, interested in the power and the promise of quantum information science. And so from the White House perspective, they've thought about four particular areas, 
and of course, quantum computing being one of the main ones, but then what do quantum networks look like? And when you think about global communication networks, what's the power of quantum there, but also in quantum simulators, but then also in quantum sensors, um, which would be not only needed for quantum networks, but also provide some interesting um, metrology opportunities as well. I know this is an eye chart. This is a technology roadmap from the White House. And again, these slides will be made available and these slides are approved for public consumption. And this slide shows basically three things on this technology roadmap for a national quantum initiative. Again, a, feder a federated or federal wide um, activity. In yellow would be the Office of Science and Technology Policy Activity. The red would then, or the salmon color would then follow with inspired legislation from the work of the White House. And then blue would be where the agencies like the National Science Foundation or Department of Energy are called to act. And I'd like to just highlight three major uh, points here. Because of the promise of quantum information science, um, the, the Office of Science and Technology Policy put together a steering committee on QIS, also known as the SC uh, QIS, to think about what are, the, what are areas that the federal agency agencies could do to really promote and expand what we're doing in quantum. That inspired legislation that actually formalized the National Quantum um, Information Act, which then inspired this OSTP priority memo that I mentioned from last year that really galvanized this federated effort. The act put three agencies in charge. And so as the assistant director for mathematical and physical sciences, I co-chair the SCQIS along with colleagues from DOE and NIST. And because of our various missions, we all have various activities that we are responsible in charge with on the steering committee. And the National Quantum Information Act actually did something rather unique in terms of federated um, activities. This blue house here, if you will, is the construct of federal agencies that are working in this area to promote quantum information sciences. And here are the three lead agencies. But what was unique about the NQI Act um, was that it actually um, inspired us to not just work with um, universities, but it actually stitched us together in a partnership with industry. And so this act is asking us to not only coordinate amongst all of the federal partners, but also with universities and with industries to make sure that we have workforce and technology improvements ongoing. This is yet another eye chart, but this is um, to show you that this is a federal wide ecosystem driven activity. And so you should see a lot of names on the right here that you're uh, familiar with. The take home actually from this, from this slide is whether you're working with the US Department of Agriculture, the National Science Foundation, some of the more DOD labs like the um, Naval Research Lab Laboratory, there will actually be resources and opportunities to engage in quantum information science and artificial intelligence research um, through these, these um, entities here. A lot is happening in this space right now and a lot of opportunities for our institutions to engage in quantum. As a way to understand um, the policies that are being generated, which then, then generate where resources go, I um, suggest you look at this um, particular report that's a policy document. The link is here at the bottom. And I just wanna highlight two areas of interest for those who uh, want to conduct quantum information science areas. One of the big drivers from the DOD side is obviously workforce development. We want a diverse workforce. And so we cannot have institutions, only five of those in the nation working in quantum. We need more institutions involved and we definitely need a diverse workforce. These are jobs of the future that will then drive new innovation for the, the jobs of the future future, if you will. We also have a concern about security. Um, quantum will be um, a revolution in national security when it comes to communication, but also our economic and banking system. And we need people who are um, US citizens to engage in this. And so they're very interested in us standing up programs that can really address the issue of workforce development with US citizens. A lot more about that in that document. The next document to highlight would be a more science policy document that comes from the community if you want to see where the leaders in quantum over the last 40 years are seeing where the, the technology is driving, I would say, please read this particular document on the quantum frontiers that actually lead 
into how this uh, program has been structured. So this is a new endeavor, if you will, as from a federated perspective. And the three agencies um, have been working very hard at building things out rapidly. We've gotten within two years to the NSF Quantum Leap Challenge Institute. That's our signature program in this area for now. DOE has also followed suit with their very large research centers. Um, and the DOD is actually following suit with even more research centers in this area. And what I really wanted to get to were these two charts here. If you've ever watched any of these OSTP administration priorities, you rarely see programs double in a year or quadruple in two to three years. And that's exactly what's gonna happen with QIS. Significant interest from the White House, significant interest from Congress. Again, there will be resources for those who want to participate in quantum information science research. So what about the National Science Foundation? What is our approach? And NSF, because we're a basic science um, agency, we're really all about trying to answer fundamental basic questions. And again, the two interesting aspects of quantum are superposition and entanglement. So we'd like to know a lot more about the science of entanglement and, and coherence and superposition. For example, these time limits, how long can quantum states exist? We know right now, the science isn't developed where they, list, uh, they last very long. Theoretically, um, entangled states, again, you know, are not impacted by distance. That's in theory. We haven't actually seen that in practice. How well can we actually um, reach this theoretical limit on distance? And then how many qubits can we actually entangle, right? The power of computing and again, the power of what we can do with um, communication will not only rely on if we can generate qubits, but how many of these qubits can we entangle and again, keep those states active. Again, the anticipated results, of course, would be advantages in quantum computing, but also, again, this global concept of quantum communication that will be revolutionary in terms of speed, but also in security. We also want to understand emergent behavior that comes from um, quantum science, whether it's naturally occurring or from engineered systems. And so, again, we're looking at new materials that will advance our knowledge of quantum systems and how to generate quantum states, but also systems um, level thinking for quantum that can lead to devices and architecture that again can advance what we know about quantum. But this whole concept of emergent behavior and complexity even makes us think about natural systems like biological systems. What can we learn from biology that can then be um, advanced in what we can do artificially or engineered systems? And again, from those, engineered systems, do that tell us more about the quantum world when it comes to biology and other systems? So that's the why for NSF. Our approach at NSF has been to try to build community. So quantum has been in the physics realm and to a degree in math and computer science, but for it to really advance, we have to have more people engaged. And it needs to cross again, this pathway of science across to all the, the various directorates at the National Science Foundation, including engineering, social sciences, et cetera. So we're really actively trying to build a community so that we can have, again, this convergence approach where people are not working in silos, but working across areas and disciplines to really advance the science and the work. And this collaboration, again, because of speed and scale, really needs to advance outside of the National Science Foundation and so we have to form robust collaborations with other agencies and with industry. This chart shows the building of our approach for quantum, where again, the National Science Foundation, because of our mission, really has been working in the quantum information sciences for 40 plus years um, with significant um, you know, platform of awards and um, achievements within the area of quantum. But we've really been trying to build our capacity, working across disciplines, again, outside of physics, but moving towards materials, science, through chemistry, um, through engineering, et cetera. And we've been working on um, building out a workforce, <clears throat> again, through various modes and mechanisms, whether it's summer schools or partnering uh, students and faculty with industry directly, and then forming much larger teams that work across disciplines as well. And, and these teams are funded in that 2 million, um, 2 million uh, range to, to work again collaboratively, 
collaboratively over a three to five year period. And then our pinnacle at right now, our flagship program would be these quantum centers, much um, larger investments, but these institutes that are now charged with being at the vanguard of science, but also helping underpin all of the, uh, the gains, whether it's collaborative research across disciplines or helping us uh, build workforce or helping us build capacity in institutions that haven't worked in this space before. We actually just started this, um, this program. Our first awards were given out last year. We have three centers. And again, these institutes are on that five million a year for five year scale. And we're asking these centers to not only work in their respective areas, but to also connect and help us build community. Over the next year, um, we have a competition going on now. We'll be making those uh, results known in the next three months. But we'll be asking uh, these awardees to connect to institutions like those at the AUC, those on this call, to really advance quantum science locally at their areas. So not just send students to these institutes, but to build programs back at these other institutes and, the, and other institutions, and more on that um, to come. So our focus right now is doing exactly that. We really need to increase capacity. We really need to increase the types of institutions, where these institutions are located, those at the institutions that are participating. And we really need to connect um, more of these institutions with our potential partners. Again, from agencies um, like DOE, NIST, um, NIH even, but also with industry, again, for this workforce development need. So I'm gonna end um, with some funding opportunities. And I wanna highlight, um, because of where we are in the year, um, the current opportunity is to learn much more about where our partnership in education and workforce development is going. It just so happens that our Education Human Resources Directorate is partnering substantially with us. They're using an all EHR approach to quantum where most of the programs in EHR, you can submit a, uh, a proposal that's focused on advancing quantum from that program's vantage point. And you can learn more about this approach at an upcoming webinar on April 27th. And you can um, um, register and apply for this webinar um, at this web link here. This webinar will focus on these six programs, but you can ask questions about opportunities in other EHR uh, focused programs. But I also wanna remind you of the programs that I mentioned earlier. These programs, again, reside within the research directorates, but you can use these as platforms to be more engaged in quantum research, as well as in a, um, artificial intelligence and data science itself. So in conclusion, I'd like to say and remind you, um, or at least I hope I've convinced you, that there are tremendous opportunities in quantum information science the administration is really driving for substantially more investments in quantum information science. We just need more of our institutions involved and engaged in doing the research here. Again, I wanna encourage you to think about all of the industries of the future. This administration is calling them tomorrow's industries. And I really wanna see our institutions thrive and be engaged wholeheartedly in not just quantum information science, but also AI, biotechnology, and advanced manufacturing. Again, these are not just tomorrow's industries, but this is the workforce of the future. So our institutions and our students really need to be engaged. And I know you'll have some questions um, and Dr. Washington and I will, will field those and we'll work together on questions, but I would love to hear your thoughts of what NSF and our partner institutions, DOE and NIST, can really do to integrate the work of HBCUs and other MSIs in really substantive ways within not just QIS, not just AI, biotech, advanced manufacturing, but our whole research enterprise. Besides the tomorrow's industries, you have your own research agendas, you have your own expertise, you have areas that you would like to advance. So I'm really interested in hearing from you ways that our agencies can be more responsive, and can really help move the needle, not just on the research um, there at your institutions, but also help build a platform for our students, again, to engage in the workforce of the future. With that, I'd like to conclude and just say thank you so much, and more than happy to take questions and have a nice time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for that informative presentation. 
And as you stated, for the workforce of the future with all these emerging technologies, we need a better way to transfer this increasing amount of data that we are accumulating. And hopefully, qubits will give us more efficient ways to do this. So, as they yes. say, it's, it's bit by bit. Bye, bye, bye. Bit by bit. <laughs> One qubit at a time. So with that, we're going to transition into the Q&A. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the HOVA platform, and I will go through them one by one. So someone asked, um, can you please speak to how the priorities of the NSF focus on the ethics of AI, biotechnology, smart cities, and other technologies? And is there support for research on the ethical use of these technologies? Uh, excellent question, and I'm so happy to uh, to field that question. And I saw that in Dr. Washington's, I believe, uh, seven or eight points of the data center. Um, one of the courses, or at least one of the areas, was ethics. That is such an important topic and area, especially for AI. And I would say uh, specifically two areas do fund um, projects or, or topics like that. One, the size organization through their efforts in AI, they're extremely interested in this aspect, right, of ethics and um, not being discriminatory, if you will, through AI and having AI that that is uh, genuine. And our social behavioral and economics organization, also known as SBE, they also have programs in AI that look at ethics and would love to see maybe a, a cross collaboration uh, between scientists and those who work in this area uh, within SBE to collaborate on how we can have more ethical AI. Um, and whether it's ethics, whether it's um, facial recognition, or even some of the AI, as you know, in justice, thinking about ways to bring ethics um, to what we're doing in the platform of machine learning, deep learning, and AI is so important. So thank you for that question. And I hope to see proposals like that from, from this collaborative. Nice, nice. And I like how you brought together the three C's, community, convergence, and collaboration. So before my current gig, I was a program officer in the Convergence Accelerator, and I led the quantum technology track. And it really was this convergence of these multiple disciplines to advance the field of quantum information sciences. So yeah, totally great. Our next question um, says, thank you for this great detailed overview on NSF's initiative in QIS. So the question is, how can NSF help in particular, an entrepreneurship in that space, i.e. provide access to research centers, equipment, groups, grants, workforce, et cetera? That's an excellent question as well. And that's why I'm here, is to talk about not just um, submitting proposals to these various initiatives, but to also tell you that these initiatives are here to help you. So the Quantum Leap Challenge Institutes, for example, that's part of their charge. They have facilities, they have resources. Part of their charge is to make those available to minority serving institutions, actually to the country writ large. And so they have processes in place for you to, to gain access. Um, one of the slides um, that talked about the three Quantum Leap Challenge Institutes also has a sub bullet about other research centers. And the other research centers, um, the Engineering Research Center, ERC on quantum, the Materials Research Science Engineering Centers, the MERSEX, there's at least four that work in quantum, and the Quantum STC that is led by Harvard but has a substantial contribution from Howard University. All of these research centers have facilities and platforms for scientists to, scientists to engage in to not just use resources in terms of uh, furnaces, qubits, um, you know, hardware, but they also have people that you can actually collaborate with and engage with. And we have mechanisms to provide seed awards, for example, that if you have a substantive concept or, or idea, we can help fund um, those kinds of initiatives. Under the new opportunities, for example, the LEAPS program, which is the MPS Research Initiation Grant program, you will be able to build in partnerships uh, within those opportunities as well. Also for the engineering ERI program, you'll be able to build in partnerships. That will allow you additional um, resources so that let's say you have success at uh, one of the Quantum Leap Challenge Institutes, you can then mirror some of those systems with resources that we will provide through LEAPS or through the EIR so that you can have an ongoing research program. One of the things that we're trying to do going forward 
is to provide access to tools at your own institution. Many times we find, you know, for MSIs in particular, we're doing most of the work during the summer. And a lot of times that's because you don't have the same resources at your institution. This is something that we'd like to fix. And we're, we're thinking about ways to couple resources with a partnership. And we'd love to hear maybe feedback or concepts on something like that, if that's um, worth pursuing. Because um, we think that that is a longer term investment in, in the institution, which provides more of a generational impact on students and on the future of the institution. And so that's where we're, we're headed. So thank you for that question, because that's exactly where we need to be thinking. Yes, thank you so much. And, you know, we'll take you up on that offer to engage with us to brainstorm about some potential solutions with the institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, recently, it's been in the news for a little while, but we have the Endless Frontier Act that has, you know, it's kind of been tossed around in the House and the Senate and across the, the mall, so to speak, in DC. And essentially, it was proposed by um, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and also Senator Todd Young of my state of Indiana. They proposed that Congress allocate $100 billion over five years to NSF to create a new technology directorate. So how does NSF see this new technology directorate either interacting with the current directorates? How do they fit in NSF? And then why is this needed? Yeah, thank you so much again for that question, because that is so timely. Um, there's a there's probably a news report daily <clears throat> about Congress's um, thoughts on the Endless Frontiers Act. And let me first say we're not allowed to comment on specific legislation, but I can at least talk in broad terms about what the legislation means to us and, and kind of how NSF is viewing this. And just to add a little bit of context. Um, the $100 billion EFA is, that's an exciting proposition, obviously, for the National Science Foundation. Again, we're $8.5 billion today, so $100 billion is a substantial increase over a short period of time that's envisioned in the EFA. And I'd say that that concept, the need to invest in an ecosystem where basic science and technology sit side by side, is something that's gaining momentum throughout Congress. And we just so happen to be in a very fortunate situation where we have congressional um, uh, folks from the High House Science and Technology Committee and others from other committees proposing alternatives to EFA, but all with an increase in the NSF budget to make this vision real. And so I think we're probably in a unique time ever where we have dueling legislation that are all talking about increasing <laughs> our NSF budget. Usually we have one up and one down. I, I don't think if we've ever been in a situation where we've had three or four different bills fighting over what the future of NSF should look like. So this is a good position, not just for NSF to be in, but for science. So the concept here is fundamental research is so important um, to the future and the health and the vibrancy of our technology enterprise over a much longer time period, but we're reaching a point in our history where technology just evolves so fast. What can we do to get more out of what we're doing in basic science? And as our director talks about this helix of, of innovation, this co-design, if you will, where basic science feeds into innovation, but if you're doing innovation and translation right, you're learning a lot about the basic science and the challenges that still need to be addressed. And so they actually coexist quite nicely. And our agency, because of the things that we do in fundamental science, it makes a lot of sense to do something like that here. So I think the National Science Foundation will look at this as how we view the agency currently, where we try to, again, dispromote silos. So the technology directorate would also be something integrated, if you will, across the, the agency. And in my words, pulling basic science, pulling these things into much faster translation, into much faster innovation. We, we do have a very robust SBIR, SCTD, STTR program. You can imagine this on steroids, really pulling more again of this basic science um, opportunities and results into more translation and innovation. It, it is an exciting time to be at the National Science Foundation, just you know, imagining what this type of legislation would do uh, for science and the types of things that we could do uh, for the nation. 
Very interesting. It will be in also interesting to see how NSF interacts with the community to bring us along with this idea of translation. Because a lot of us who have interacted with NSF has, we've done it in the basic science research generation component, but not in this new way. So I'll, I'll be, we'll be looking for ways that NSF will engage with the community to bring us along with, with them in this new path forward. So. Yes. And actually, can I respond to that real quick, Dr. Washington? Sure. So from um, my, you know, my previous HBCU at and working with other HBCUs, you know, many of us have had quite, you know, robust success, if you will, with DOD agencies, places where we can get contracts, where we can do things on more of the innovation translation side. Um, I really look at this new directorate as a rich place for partnership with uh, HBCUs who know very well how to work with the DOD constructs in terms of uh, contracts and things that are much more uh, targeted and specific. So I look at this as not just a win for NSF, but a win for our community that already knows how to do this, this hybrid, this DNA helix uh, dance, as, as you said, from basic science translation into things that are much more use inspired, much more practical, maybe even societally driven in terms of change that we wanna see locally. Uh, I think this provides significant opportunity way more um, than we have seen before with some of the initiatives at NSF. So I, I'm excited to see how our HBCUs and Hispanic Servant Institutions uh, adapt to this new change, this new opportunity. Very good. So, so somebody raised an interesting concern. They say, how can the funding for this new directorate, this new technology directorate or whatever it will be called, um, that you are now talking about, not overtake the other existing directorates? The growth proposed by EFA and the other bills appears to be quite fast. Um, yeah, thank you for that question and a chance to clarify, because again, NSF's culture would not have this standalone, so it would be something integrated across all of the, the basic science research. And so the basic side of the house is going to benefit by being able to, again, partner, collaborate with a new directorate uh, of this magnitude and size. So the other competing bills um, do not have us at the same level, substantially lower uh, level for NSF. And um, the, the rate of growth would be, uh, again, measured and slower. But whether it's a, a very large number or whether it's a slow uh, rate of rise, it's meant to be integrated again within the full vision of NSF. And again, not a standalone, but an entity that would benefit the basic science as well. Interesting. It almost sounds akin to the Office of Integrative Activities. It would be interesting to see how this is actually washed out as a, as a directorate. So it's, it's not silo. And so the person goes, they say, um, they understand that earmark, earmarks, they're now called community projects, may well come back. Can you talk a little bit about these in the context of the NSF? That's an interesting question. That's probably um, outside of my wheelhouse of knowledge. So I might unfortunately have to skip that question <laughs> and say, um, I, have not, I have not heard in any of our executive leadership meetings about community projects or again, a pivot from earmarks to some other mechanism. So that's an interesting provocative question that I will have to go and research and, and try to understand as well. So thank you for bringing that question to the forefront. It's always good to have those interesting questions. Just mm -hmm. out, right? Someone asked about um, going back to QIS. Are there applications for QIS to health or healthcare? Are there any connections? And then you also talk about different communities coming together. Would NSF partner with NIH to look at how QIS can bring some healthcare solutions? Um, absolutely. So. Um, to answer the, the second part first, um, we, we do have a, a collaboration or ongoing you know, collaborations with NIH. NIH is, is on that federal plot or that one slide that shows all the different federal agencies. There are some federal agencies that are under the end user category. So those who would benefit by us having stronger AI, stronger QIS, stronger data initiatives. NIH falls squarely under this um, end user um, category, but we are working with them on what does QIS mean? Again, in this fundamental sense of biology, what can we learn from quantum biological systems that can help advance the research at NIH? Uh, this translation piece would be further down the line 
outside of mathematical and physical sciences, but surely engineering, SBE, and in, in size do have um, collaborations and researchers that are working on those end goals that can help NIH serve the public in a much richer and more uh, responsive way. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, Smart and Connected Health is, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Washington, Smart and Connected Health within our size directorate um, is a wonderful example of an area that seeks to do uh, societal change, but also is underrooted under uh, basic science. And that's one of the areas to, if you're interested in, in working in this uh, field, things that might be more NIH, CDC uh, related, that would be a program um, for you to look into. Great, thank you. And then somebody has a question about error correcting. So, so they say that there's a lot known about error correcting codes, but what about for quantum bits? Is there a way to actually know when your transmitted data is not corrupted? That, that is a huge area of research, um, error correction for qubits, huge area. Um, a lot of uh, resources uh, going to that, not just in the quantum Leap challenge institutes, but in each one of the layers of funding within QIS. Um, and so that, that is a ripe area of, of uh, discovery and research. And we need more people uh, working in this area, for sure. And especially as the systems become more and more complex beyond 10 and 50 qubits that we have today. Great. So somebody says, wonderful talk. And I think everybody is thinking that right now at this moment. Um, would you say a few words about the new fellowship announced recently by NSF, namely the Math and Physical Sciences Ascending Postdoctoral Research Fellowship, MPS Ascend? Sure, yeah, and thank you for that question. This is a brand new program. Um, we have not had a directorate-wide postdoc program. MPS um, has five divisions, so astronomy, chemistry, math, materials, research, and physics, and astronomy and math those two divisions have a history of postdoc programs, but we don't in the other three divisions. What we decided this year to do was to have a MPSY program to accept um, those disciplines that are funded by our various divisions. So for example, in chemistry, that could be chemists, but also chemical engineers. In materials research, that could be engineers, mathematicians, biologists, uh, material scientists, et cetera. But those working in MPS um, research fields apply to be postdoc, postdoctoral scholars, and we will review them within the division. So high level of um, you know, rigor in terms of the research and the background of the students. But we will have a postdoc program for underrepresented minorities or those who are willing to work in the area of broad anticipation to get more underrepresented minorities to go towards um, academia or research labs. We're hoping to uh, build this program and we're hoping to expand this over the next few years. This is our first inaugural competition and we're hoping again to see um, a lot of interest and a lot of students really benefit from this new program. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'm excited about the new program. I, I always worry that I wouldn't want to put on the, the back of my shoulders who that my students' shoulders who always have have a lot to work with being an underrepresented minority, that they're the ones who have to do the broadening participation. <coughs> so I hope that there is some a, a balance that the postdoc scholars are actually supposed to do research and not have to bear the burden at that early career point in time to fix this thing of broadening participation. Yeah, that's correct. And the postdocs are, I mean, this is funded out of the research directorates. And so um, they're there to do research um, in, their, in their discipline and domains. Awesome, awesome. So somebody asked a question about um, HBCUs and research. So they say, what would you say our research at HBCUs need to demonstrate to get the review panels of the NSF to consider them for a quantum center? As we, us uh, faculty folks, me, myself included, oftentimes from HBCUs, our proposals come to panel and we get discounted because our institution is an HBCU and we're not one of the, the R1's um, top uh, funded research centers. So what, what do we need to do to demonstrate that we can uh, run a quantum center that we're palatable and that we would be have an honest consideration? Yeah, thank you for that. And again, as a former HBCU faculty and department chair who has applied for ERCs and SDCs, I thoroughly understand uh, that question. 
in that frustration. And I have two two part answers to that. So the first one is um, the competition for a center and institute that is is very is very strong, right? It's very strong competition. You are competing with R1s and you're competing with a significant number of R1s where the number of awards are gonna be very limited. Typically the funding size of these, you know, inhibits the number of awards that are gonna be made. So to start thinking about centers, you have to be thinking years ahead, not the one year ahead before you start submitting. And you really need to start building a track record and it can't be just yourself. Centers and institutes have teams of people who are working and advancing in a particular field. And so we need, we need you know, you to bring a colleague, uh, three colleagues. Um, they don't have to work in the same department, but looking at a grand challenge and getting a track record working in quantum will help you become more competitive for an institute. So that's in terms of your home institution really trying to work at getting an institute. Usually the law of three, three individuals working in th three different areas that are advancing a grand challenge is great. If you can have five, even better. Again, it's more about the intellectual power of the institution to advance again a grand challenge. And so we need to start working on these areas, AI, data, quantum, much earlier and building out teams of people who can do this. If you are a chair and you're looking at hiring and you're looking at hiring in particular areas, these industries of the future are excellent areas to be thinking about hiring. And if you have the power to do cluster hiring, this is the perfect time to be thinking about cluster hiring so that you can have people already assembled to, to work in teams. The second approach is more of a federated approach. And I've seen this um, work well for a few of, of these institutes and centers. And so if you can't form a team of five at your institution, can you form a team of two and partner with another institution where there's three or four at a, at a HBCU working in this area? And again, build a track record of working with each other, advancing a grand challenge, and again, putting together publications, again, this track record of working with each other. That's another approach where our HBCUs can be very competitive, applying for centers and institutes. Wonderful. So you're talking about building these teams of people, and I, I love the idea of thinking about a strategic hire. So what sort of support does NSF have to assist HBCUs to build towards the capacity to build out these teams? Yeah, that's an excellent question as well. And so let me start from the HRD side first, um, because the HBCU up is there, um, and um, that program is really all about capacity building and really capacity building for the future. So if you have a plan to have more career awardees at your institution, if you have a plan to have a QIS center or HDR Institute, if you have a plan to build out capacity in this area with faculty and with students, the HBCU Up program is an excellent place to start because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a long-term plan to move or at least leverage the HBCU Up funds into other and broader funding opportunities for the departments, for the faculty, for the institution. CREST, a CREST center is an excellent way to do this, right? Again, CREST is also looking for a long-term plan to not just have a CREST 1, CREST 2, CREST 3 and change topics all the time. They're looking for a CREST that can then build and grow into something much more sustainable long-term. So I say leverage those programs as much as possible. If you're in materials research, the PREM program, Partnership for Research, Education and Materials, that program exists to do the exact same thing, but in materials. So if you're working in uh, data, AI or quantum and you have a long-term plan, I want more career awardees. I would love to have a small MERSEC. Maybe this could be become a chemistry center of innovation. Those types of things, planning and leveraging those resources that's what the agency is looking for. That's what we'd like to invest in. Wonderful, wonderful. I hear the chimes outside my window, which, which means that we have reached the top of the hour. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for sharing us the insights from the National Science Foundation and some viable paths forward where we can engage in these upcoming and exciting research opportunities. Thank you so very much. Great, With thank you.
with that, we're going to take a 30 minute respite break and we will be back at 1.30 with a symposium for a round of really interesting and awesome lightning talks. So we hope to see everybody back here at 1.30 Eastern time. See you soon. Excellent, have a fantastic day, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Jones, you too.